Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Modern Engine Challenges Drive Damper Innovation. I am Amanda Harmoning, and I will be moderating today's event. I am an admin assistant here at AERA, and joining me is Rob Monroe. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Rob Monroe. I look after membership and technical development here at AERA, and both Amanda and I are going to be in the background, and we're going to help to answer any questions that you've got throughout the webinar. If you have any questions about AERA related material, uh, we can do that throughout the webinar. Uh, if you have any questions about the webinar itself, we'll save those to the end, and both Brian and Aaron will answer those when we get to the end. Now, Amanda is going to explain to you how to use the control panel, which is going to be located in the upper right of your screen. So I'll bring her back on in the next few slides. She'll show you how to use that. So, hey, Amanda. All right, you guys. First off, there's a couple different ways you can listen into today's webinar. One is to call in and use your telephone. And if you do that, make sure you enter the access pin in the audio pin. That Those two things, make sure that the lines stay muted during the presentation. Um, the other one is to listen in with your computers, mic, and speakers. And again, just make sure you have that appropriate radio button selected so you can hear everything and everything stays muted and we're good to go. A uh, couple other things you need to know, there's a little reddish orange arrow. This allows you to collapse and expand your control panel during the presentation. That just gets it out of the way so you can view your presentation in full screen and gives you a quick access to ask any questions you may have, which takes us to the questions box. And if at any point you have any questions, comments, anything for us, go ahead and enter those there and we will get them answered as Rob said at the end or if needed, we'll follow up with you afterwards. So thank you again for joining us. And at this time, I'll hand it back over to Rob. Super, thanks, Amanda. So just a couple housekeeping slides to go through before we get on with today's webinar. For those of you that have joined us and you don't know who we are, uh, AERA is a nonprofit association that we've been serving engine builders since 1922. So we've been around a very long time. Our main role here at AERA is to provide our members with technical information and specifications. So our tech department, uh, we work Monday through Friday, we're 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Central Time, and we are here to, uh, like I say, to answer any technical information that you're looking for. What we really try and encourage our members to do is allow us to do all of your research for you. That's why you're paying for membership. If, uh, you know, you're probably better off on the shop floor making money, do what you do best, so just make us a little shopping list, a quick little phone call or email, give us that information and we'll, uh, we'll get that over to you right away. If you join AERA, you will receive seven specification manuals. So we've got our block and connecting rod manual, crankshaft and cylinder head manual, the valve lash, the flywheel, and the failure analysis manuals. So as an example, the, uh, the block and the cylinder head manuals are well over 700 pages. They're full of all the engine specifications. So as a new member, you will receive that in your new member kit and you'll get all seven of those manuals. For those of you that are on the webinar today and you're not receiving our Engine Professional magazine, uh, just use that little questions box and, and leave a little note there for Amanda and, ask, and tell her that you do want to receive Engine Professional magazine and uh, we'll get your contact information and we'll get you set up so that you can receive the, uh, the magazine. So, Four editions come out every year, and uh, it's every three months, and it's full of application-driven articles, uh, things like the webinar that we're talking about today. Vibratech has done articles in the magazine before, and the idea of the magazine is once you've read it, you will be able to apply the knowledge that's in there and use that right away. So uh, it's a great magazine to be able to do that with. Another thing I want to mention is your Contingency Connection Coupon Booklet. This is the booklet that you would receive as a member. And in that booklet, manufacturers have given a lot of discounts in there through, through different, different discounts through coupons. As an example, AERA has a coupon in there. Uh, if your process subscription is coming up soon or your renewal, $50 off, it, there's a coupon in there to do that. So it's really easy free money to be able to take advantage of. If you're gonna be a new member of AERA, uh, $50 off um, or $75 off the membership or $50 off your Process Pro subscription. So take advantage of that book. There's, there's good discounts in there and that is free money for you. As an example, if you do join AERA, uh, the typical US active shop, 
using your contingency connection coupon booklet is only $324 for the year to do that, or we can do it at $27 per month. We have a, a monthly payment program that we can set you up on. Uh, we don't charge any service fees for doing that, but if it works out better for you to do it monthly, we can do that as well. Last slide here before we get into today's webinar, I wanted to mention that the regional conferences are coming up for 2019 and we have three left. We've got TriStar Engines, August 9th out in Wisconsin. Liberty Engine Parts is September 14th out in Pennsylvania. And Rottler Manufacturing's Open House is October 10th and 11th and that's out in Washington. And if you're anywhere within driving distance or close by to any one of these locations, Make sure to get registered, and uh, these are very well worth attending. So if you want any more information about them or if you want to register, simply go to www.aera.org backslash conferences.html, and right in there will be lots of information to, to, to register. Or you can see what presenters are at each particular regional. These conferences have technical presentations, exhibitors. Uh, there's an exhibitor's row. There's a supplied lunch. But best of all, it's a chance to network with industry peers. So it's like a, you know, it feels like a little mini trade show, uh, but you get lots of one on one time with your exhibitors. So it, it's a great opportunity to go and, and see that. So um, on that note, what I'll do is we'll get on with today's webinar uh, Modern Engine Challenges Drive Damper Innovation. Today's webinar is presented by Brian LeBaron, who is a marketing coordinator at Fluid Damper and Vibratech as well as Aaron Nyman. He's Vibration Solutions Manager at Fluid Damper and Vibratech. So welcome, guys. How's it going today? Welcome, Rob. Thank you for having us on. Uh, this is Brian here. Um, hello, and this is Aaron here. And uh, you know, we're just having a great day here in Western New York, and hopefully you know, we'll be able to share a little bit about what uh, we do and what vibration dampers can do for you. So as Rob just introduced us, uh, my name is Brian LeBaron. I'm the marketing coordinator here at uh, Fluid Damper and Vibratech. Uh, I've been with the company for about eight years. Uh, some of you may have seen me or met me at PRI or some of the AERA regional tech, uh, tech conferences, um, but also a lot of the long form articles that you see published in magazines and such, I contribute to a lot of those, oftentimes of uh, interviewing Aaron and relying on him for his expertise. Um. Yes, and uh, like I said, you know, in addition to helping out with, uh, you know, helping out Brian with his articles, I also, um, you know, I've been with Vibratech and Fluid Amper for just about 10 years, coming up in January, uh, and I do um, a lot of the uh, the engineering design work and uh, torsional analysis, uh, validation testing. I'll travel, um, you know, sometimes if they let me out, and I get to go to some of the PRI shows too. So, um, you know, if you ever see our booth at any of those shows, sometimes I'll be there, especially the bigger ones like PRI. So the idea for today's topic, um, which will be explained in the next issue of Engine Professional, um, it dates back to last fall when Aaron was asked to present a speech at Engine Expo Detroit. Um, now Engine Expo is like the PRI uh, engine show for the OEM performance engines. Um, and we'll get into a bit of uh, those challenges coming up. But the title of that speech was Lightweight Viscous Dampers in High Temperature, High Performance Engines. It was very well received last fall, and it gave, uh, gave the context to do a white paper and then uh, turn it over to AERA to use this information as well. Um, and that brought in the Vibratech TVD side. Uh, those unfamiliar with Vibratech, um, we are a torsional vibration solutions provider. Uh, we do full torsional vibration analysis. We do damper development. Uh, all the manufacturing is done in-house, uh, right here south of Buffalo, New York. And then we all do OEM fulfillment. Uh, we've been doing viscous dampers since 1946, and we are uh, ISO 9001-2015 quality system certified. As far as Vibratech TVD, we do have a lot of OEM experience. Um, we currently have about 36 powertrain partners around the world that deal in a core industries such as automotive, commercial, off-highway, agriculture, marine, rail, oil and gas, and defense. Uh, so wide that we claim that we're the widest experience in the industry for uh, damper manufacturing. Uh, we can do anything from a one-pound cam damper 
up to a 7,000 pound crankshaft damper for a gas compression pumping engine, uh, anywhere in the range of 100 horsepower up to 25,000 horsepower. And dampers themselves can be used on a multiple engine components, including the crankshaft, the camshafts, driveline, electric drives, ro uh, rotating machinery, test bed equipment, and gear rattle reduction. Uh, we see that a lot in, uh, in uh, drivetrains. Well, many of you are probably familiar with fluid damper, uh, been in the performance aftermarket since around 1985. Uh, and in that time, uh, we've become to be the, uh, the leading viscous damper uh, in motorsports, but we've had quite a run in the past five years alone. Um, currently, we do OEM design and manufacturing to GM Performance's Corvette Racing Division. Um, so the Corvette Racing team is running fluid damper, uh, have been doing so for a couple of years now. Uh, we have uh, eight recent OEM projects in, in the United States and Europe for high-performance automotive and marine applications. Um, a lot of what we're seeing in this high-performance uh, automotive is uh, what's making it work and making it happen and be successful there. It's bringing in that cross-industry experience. Um, we look back at the previous side, what Vibrotech deals with, um, and we can uh, draw a lot of experience coming over from the marine performance side and from the defense side. Um, as far as fluid dampers, catalog dampers go, uh, we've been outpacing industry growth for the past 10 years. We're doing three times the volume of fluid dampers now than we were in 2009. Um, but despite that, we stay very focused and very humble because there's a lot of stiff competition coming up in viscous dampers. So we have our our game face on and, and a lot of R&D happening here uh, for tackling the challenges that we're seeing coming up in these modern engines. And there has been a, a proliferation of viscous dampers on the, auto, on the OEM side. Uh, the list keeps getting longer each year, it seems. Uh, currently that we know of, uh, Audi, BMW, Ferrari, Ford, GM Performance, Cosworth, Lamborghini, Lexus, McLaren, Austin Martin, Maserati, um, Bugatti is not on the list. We, we know that one now. And then, of course, the Ram Cummins all use a viscous damper. Now, I got to disclose they're not always a Vibrotech damper or always a fluid damper, but they are using viscous damper technology. Um, and this proliferation came mid 2000s. Uh, Cosworth broke a lot of ground uh, in the Formula One racing with their 2.4 liter flat plane V8. Uh, before Formula One had RPM limits and, and later went to hybrid drives, Cosworth hit 20,000 RPM with a V8, uh, had over 1,300 pounds of crank pin loading. They incorporated 13 dampening devices on this engine. They had a, a viscous crankshaft damper and running four viscous camshaft dampers. So viscous dampers are proven out in high performance Formula One racing and it's now carrying over into the flagship cars by all these high-end uh, automotive manufacturers. Uh, with that, we talked a lot about viscous dampers. I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron, and he's gonna explain how they work. So uh, one, of the, one of the big things about viscous dampers is they have a uh, sealed outer housing, and that's typically something that's uh, you know, machined out of either it can be steel, uh, aluminum, or a couple of you know, different materials. And uh, that outer housing is directly coupled to the crankshaft. So a lot of a lot of traditional domestic applications, it's a press fit. Um, some of them, sometimes they're a bolt-on flange, um, and that connects directly to the end of the crankshaft. Um, and then that housing, that housing is a sealed housing, typically laser welded. Um, and inside of that housing, we have an internal ring. We call that the inertia ring or an internal flywheel. And that ring moves in and out of moves in and out of phase with the, the vibrations in order to counteract the vibrations uh, that your engine produces from the firing. And in between the housing and that inertia ring, there's a, a highly viscous silicone oil. And that silicone oil is running in a, uh, a precision machine gap. And that's what helps stabilize that flywheel from going in and out of phase. And it gives the damper a specific tar you know, a target to operate under. And because that flywheel isn't bonded, you get a broadband damping effect, uh, like a bell curve of effectiveness uh, for a viscous damper. Um, when 
that bell curve of effectiveness is a huge benefit compared to a rubber tune damper that you typically see on an OEM engine. Those rubber tune dampers have a start and stop frequency that they, they only operate at those resonant conditions, and that's typically a small window, uh, right around 50 hertz uh, if you're looking at frequencies. And they focus those dampers at the worst of the vibration in the engine. So um, one of the main reasons to upgrade to a, a better damper, um, in this case, you know, a viscous damper, is if, if you're doing work to your engine, um, you know, that small focus window of your rubber tune damper that comes with the engine can move or change. Um, and what you want to do is make sure that you have a proper damper that's focused, uh, that's got a, a wider effective range and window if you're changing things in the engine, especially hard components. Um, and a good damper will extend the durability of your, you know, of your engine. It'll decrease your main, your bearing wear, and it'll also help, uh, you know, give you more accurate timing because you're not having, um, you're not driving vibrations through your timing gear or your timing belt. So uh, some of the hard components that you know we have that, that can be changed in the engine, especially if you're building performance engines, specifically the crankshaft. Let's say you're running a, a higher stroke crankshaft, uh, or you're switching from a you know a cast crankshaft to a billet crankshaft, or even a forged crankshaft. Those all change uh, the way that the engine operates. If you look at a typical crankshaft, uh, you have your your cylindrical mains and your crank pins. And then you have a series of masses that connect them together. And if you break that down into a system, you have masses and then the pins and the mains act as springs. And those connect each other together. And they all have different uh, you know, RPMs where they'll go into a resonance. But if you change the amount of mass, and if you change the, uh, you know, the diameter or the length or you know, the distance from the center of the pins, you're changing the spring rates between them, and all of those things can change the uh, the resonant frequency of the system. If you have a small tune damper, you could be pushing that resonant or that resonance outside of the effectiveness of the damper. You can also have uh, issues with uh, with dampers aging and wearing out with dampers that are exposed to out outside elements. Uh, this slide shows some conditions that can happen you know, from a new damper to a heavily worn damper, um, particularly dry rotting in the rubber, or even you know losing rubber coming out of it or melting out if you're running through a high heat application. So uh, you know Brian put together a, a good top ten list of things to look for uh, if you it have, gives you you have excessive torsional vibration. So one of the first signs you, you can look at is cracked, bulging, or missing rubber from your damper. So that comes from running either too much heat through the damper, or even just from over time. If you're if you got an older engine application, they they the weather ages with temperature. You know, and the rubber can get worn out. Um, you can also experience damper wobble, and that's where uh, the the outer ring that's rubber bonded together can can slip, and either run non-concentric or it can even shift uh, axially and then it'll appear like a wobble especially if you look at it under a timing light. You can also see separation between the, the hub and the outer ring which will cause your timing marks to slip uh, and in some applications if they read the outside of the damper for um, signal you know for an RPM signal you can you can get misfire codes from it. Uh, and also, you know, if you open up an engine and you find excessive wear on the main bearings, that's a good sign that your vibration damper isn't doing its job. You can also see oil pump failure. Uh, a lot of times, if you're building a, you know, a shorter crankshaft engine, uh, like a like a V6 or V8 or even four cylinders, you may not necessarily see a broken crankshaft, but you might see other failures in the, the engine. And then an oil pump gear, especially if it's a powdered metal uh, manufactured gear. Is a pretty uh, pretty clear sign that you're having a problem with uh, vibrations, and then of course the broken crankshaft, especially if it's broken in an unusual place, uh, like if it break on the first in the first crank pin or just somewhere where you, you don't typically see it, and then you can also see bolts backing out, especially uh, flywheel bolts. Uh, that's that's pretty common, 
and then you know belt slap or even thrown belts or even broken accessory brackets. So now that Aaron explained you know what a viscous damper is, how it works, signs to look for to upgrade, and what's going on, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the the challenges that we're hearing today, uh, both on the performance side and the OE side, as uh, we get into damper development. And there's a couple of trends going on. When we look at high performance today for uh, a race car, for an OEM high end performance car, a couple of things. In common, um, there's an emphasis on increased aerodynamics, either for track times and performance or for better fuel economy. But as you divert air around the engine bay, not through it, under her temperatures are on the rise. Now, helping matters is that we have higher horsepower per, la per liter, um, which gives you excessive temperatures as well. Add in now forced induction, that's the recipe for greater vibration amplitudes. So we have higher vibration, higher temperatures, and now we're pushing even higher RPMs. Perfect example how this all came together. Oh, oh. was uh, last January at the Detroit Auto Show, uh, Ford released the uh, the Mustang Shelby GT500. It's coming factory equipped with a 5.2 liter V8. 700 plus horse right off the showroom floor, 7,500 RPM rev limit, over 1,800 PSI uh, cylinder pressure. It comes factory equipped with aluminum viscous damper. Now, I have to be humble and say that's not our damper, but we do have dampers in R&D and in um, production that are on par or exceed the performance of this engine. And uh, when it comes to thermal management and getting a damper to survive under those conditions, even Ford came right out and said uh, at the release of the, the, the Shelby GT500 that at wide open throttle, the cooling system needs to extract up to 230 kilowatts of heat energy, enough to heat a dozen homes. They put a lot of focus in getting the airflow through that engine to help cool it down. And the parts under that hood have to survive. Which leads us to uh, back into viscous dampers again, because when requests come to us to, to build a better damper, to, uh, to design something that's going to hold up, it has to have rotational integrity, it has to handle a high vibration power density, that uh, more uh, higher horsepower per liter, um, the thermal management, the damping uh, medium, um, silicone even, has to hold up under these conditions long term. Um, then we need the in, uh, integrated design for rate, weight reduction. Anywhere we can shave weight off the rotating assembly, um, everyone's looking for that. But it also has to act as a damper and uh, help things hold up as well, too. And also, as Aaron alluded to uh, with resonant frequencies, when you start pushing a wide RPM range, you can pick up multiple resonances. So the damper has to uh, be effective throughout the power band. Um, so, I'll turn it back over to Aaron, and he's going to explain a little bit about uh, some of our solutions that we've come up with and some of the uh, proprietary advancements here at Vibratech. Thank, thank you, Brian. So, uh, one, of, one of the biggest things about the modern engine applications that we've seen, you know, is engine downsizing, but not necessarily downsizing horsepower output. So when you're pushing more horsepower out of a smaller displacement application, uh, you're going to see a higher vibration power density uh, being pushed into the damper. So you're pushing more energy into the damper. And the way that the damper works, uh, you know, when that, when that mass moves in and out of phase with the housing, it generates heat from shearing through the silicone oil. And the damper is designed in such a way that the, uh, the outer housing has a specific amount of surface area that lets it basically had shed the heat like a radiator. Uh, and that, that's why you'll see that most fluid ampers that you, you can pick up, you know, off the shelf, they have a uh, zinc chromate coating. Uh, and that's so that way it's not being insulated like a paint would. And in really in high performance applications, it's very important to get the right amount of coating, the right damper geometry, uh, and the very, you know, specific amounts and the right materials in order to make the damper do the right thermal have the right thermal properties so it can heat stabilize in when it's working in applications. Um, 
the material construction for the damper housings and the internal inertia rings are, are very flexible. Um, so that way you can design the damper to suit the customer's needs. Um, you know, when we mention a light, lightweight damper, we're talking about um, the outer housing more, more specifically because that's the part of the housing, or that, that part we call the hub mass, and that gets added to the crankshaft. Um, and then the internal ring is what does all the work. So if you can make your outer housing as lightweight as possible, you can, you can get more, uh, more vibration benefit out of a smaller total mass. And then, um, you know, we, we can achieve that using a steel, a lightweight steel design that has, you know, some, you know, creative mill working or different, you know, different weight reduction techniques. We can also do that with other materials such as aluminum, um, and that gives you even more thermal advantages. But you, but you also want to make sure that you incorporate the right amount of weight so you still have a damper that's going to be effective to reduce the vibration. Another good way to reduce weight for you know, when, you, when you're going through for a damper design is you want to optimize your damper uh, for what you what the customer wants the damper to do or what the end user needs the damper to do. So let's say that you know you need a belt drive system. Uh, you want to make sure that that's incorporated into the damper so you don't have to use you know extra fasteners or you know extra flanges by adding extra weight to that housing. So if you incorporate that into the damper, um, you can get a little bit extra flexibility there. And then also PTO drives are important to incorporate into the damper, especially on performance builds. Um, you know, you may need the PTO for dry sump applications uh, or additional pulleys for supercharging. So it's a, just a way for a flexible design. And you can also have a customizable crankshaft interface. Uh, so you have like a press fit application for parts that are, you know, designed for a press fit or you have a slip fit with bolted flanges for flanged crankshafts, or even uh, taper lock uh, connections are common in aircraft industry and some small engines. And then, uh, you know, one of, one of the biggest things in, in advancements, even with, you know, with the damper that goes hand in hand is the advancements and the tools that we use to design the dampers. Uh, one of the, the biggest, you know, one of the good advancements that we've seen is uh, the advancements in testing equipment. So our, our, our FFT analyzer that's um, made by Rotec uh, is right now about the size of that 10-inch tablet you see on the screen. It's a very portable, flexible system that we can use, and it'll take, you know, thousands of measurements uh, per second um, through, a, and through a high-resolution encoder so that way we can measure um, you know exactly how much change in RPM the crankshaft nose has while we're testing the damper, and we can back that into angular displacement. And uh, you know, along along with that, you know that that goes hand in hand, making sure that we're designing a part that's fully validated before we release it. We also do full um, engine modeling, like what I mentioned before, a mass elastic system, so masses and springs. Um, we can, if we get that information, you know, from 3D models or supplied from an engine manufacturer, we can build a model and figure out exactly what RPMs the crankshaft's going to resonate at. So we can figure out, you know, either what engine changes will do to that resonance or how we can design a damper that's most efficient for that application. And then we can also run that through software to make sure the rotational integrity is up to standards. And then we can test, you know, on engines or you know, on an engine stand or on a chassis dyno or even in vehicle testing because of flexible test equipment. And then we also have multiple channels so we can test multiple speed signals like in dry lot drive line applications. So you can see what the vibration does once it gets past the engines further downstream. Um, we, we've done quite a few tests on mass transit bus systems uh, for drive line resonances, whether it's noise or even gear wear. Uh, for designing dampers to reduce those. And all of our design and development goes through an ISO 9001 certified process. So, another, you know, since, you know, we've been coming up with, you know, working in the designing and using viscous dampers since 1946, we you know, actually, you know, held the original patents for the design for the dampers. You know, over the years, you know, we don't just let the technology go stagnant and just apply it to different sizes. We do a lot of work 
going through the different individual components and keeping up with technology and keeping up with advancements in those different areas. Uh, you know, the silicone oil, you know, we, we go through and we do a lot of work to make sure that we have uh, good in-house quality standards. So we make sure we're getting consistent and repeatable uh, damping fluids. We go through and we can do in-house custom blends for both older applications and for newer high performance applications. Uh, we can look at different additives uh, for for getting us um, higher temperature ceilings or you know friction modification. So there's a lot that goes into even just the small amount of fluid, you know, maybe 30 cc's or less that go right into the damper. We also do a lot of uh, research and development on internal bearing technology. Uh, in between the the internal flywheel and the housing, we have some bearings for thrust and uh, radial loading. And these are mainly for you know situations if the damper is running out of round slightly, which can happen in performance engines. I mean I've seen situations where an you know an engine could drop a cylinder and blow the engine block right off of the crankshaft. So you know we got to design the damper to handle you know as extreme application as that. Uh, and we put a lot of research and development in selecting the proper bearing based materials and additives in order to make sure that we're getting a damp a bearing that can handle the right uh, pressure and velocity values, uh, but that'll also, but it'll also provide you know the right amount of friction, so that way the damper is a, a long life and also handles the amount of heat that the damper is going to be exposed to. And uh, we take all you know all this research and development you know from either extreme motorsport applications or durability testing, um, you know through our VibraTech brands, and we apply that to both VibraTech and fluid damper parts in order to increase the uh, durability and effectiveness of our parts uh, from OEM to performance aftermarket. So one of the things I touched on earlier was you know having a specific required amount of mass for the damper to do the work for your engine. Um, you know the amount of, you want to make sure that sometimes you have a very small working window. Um, if anything you know Pulley drive, you know, pulleys on the front of engines are getting smaller, and space is getting more and more constrained. So sometimes you have to get creative with the the mass that you're adding to the system for the damper. And this particular damper is a good example. Uh, this is a about a, an eight and a quarter or eight and a half inch diameter uh, damper that we make for the 2JZ inline six. And this particular damper uh, weighs, I want to say, it weighs about a pound less than our small block Chevy damper. But it does about three times the work because the mass is located further out. Even though it's got a much thinner, you know, mass, it's it's located on a much larger diameter, so we can get three times the vibration control out of a, a lighter damper. So that's just uh, you know one of the, the th many things that comes into mind when we're designing dampers for performance applications. Then we touched on thermal management a little bit before too. Um, one of the biggest things, you know, the very the, one of the biggest things and most simple things that you can do is make sure that you have proper airflow uh, getting into your engine bay. It's, you know, just a simple, the same concept as not blocking your radiator uh, when you're doing a lot of you know, racing or even if you're in you know low speed conditions, you want to make sure you have the right amount of airflow dynamics. And then if you don't have those airflow dynamics, there's still more that it can be done. Um, Ryan talked a little bit about working in marine applications. You, know, you can look at different materials, and maybe you can use multiple materials and use a pulley as a heat sink. Um, you can get into cooling fins, which are very popular on stationary engine applications, like gen set generator sets or uh, gas pumping stations. And then you can all go a step further and look at specialized surface treatments. Uh, this particular example on the image shown here is a metallic coating. And this metallic coating essentially gives the damper, you know, an exponential amount of, of small cooling fins, and it gives you more surface area for heat transfer, and it also catches more air in this low airflow application. Then beyond that, you can go a step further, and this is something we've seen in, you know, ironically, heavy-duty uh, diesel applications and also hypercars with active oil cooling where the engine where the, the damper is actually installed inside the engine in a sealed environment and then you can use pressurized oil jets to cool apart. Um, what that allows you to do is get a use a smaller, lighter damper that's made out of a higher density material, 
but uh, you get more damping out of a smaller package, so it's more packaging friendly. Um, but you can cool it using uh, you know, active oil cooling. So uh, one of the you know one of one of our biggest you know or I would not say most fun recent you know, applications that we've done is we've worked with Corvette Racing. Uh, and they're, you know, part of the GM Performance Racing Division. It's a factory-backed race team. Uh, you know, they came to us because they had a problem with their current damper supplier. It was a, you know, performance rubber damper that I'm sure everyone's familiar with. And uh, they had some problems with, you know, parts not lasting the duration of their races. Um, you know, they were still winning races, but, you know, they knew that they could improve and be better. So they, you know, they came to, they weren't getting the feedback that they are hoped for from their suppliers, so they came to us. And you know we we jumped at the chance to work with uh, work with them. And if you're familiar with them at all, you know that they're a great group great group of people to work with. And uh, you now they they gave us the task of designing a damper that would last at, at the minimum a 30 hour race duration. So we took all of our different principles that we talked about here. You know we just integrated a, a lot of components together. They had a damper ring and a hub and a separate timing wheel before. And we integrated that together to a single piece damper housing. Uh, we integrated the required timing teeth for uh, for the engine timing. We integrated a press fit hub so that way they could get a nice tight connection with the crankshaft. Uh, we also integrated a PTO drive for them. But we were also able to you know get creative with the parts in order to make sure that it was still a lightweight solution. Uh, made it out of a you know, into steel outer housing, so that way the part would be durable enough to to last. Um, and you know, they ran our parts for a few races, and we asked them you know, if we could get some back to look at, you know, go through them and do a full analysis. And they were like new, so then they ran them for the rest of the season, and they've had nothing but success since then with the parts. And they have to re rebuild engines much less, and you know. So you know, we were able to provide a good solution to them uh, that followed the design principles that we talked about. So Aaron touched on how a lot of things come together here at uh, between FiberTech GVD and, and fluid damper. And uh, I want to say there's probably a stereotype out there that uh, viscous dampers are only for low RPM diesel applications. And I can see where that comes from because during the 1970s and 80s, about 90% of the viscous damper production here at uh, Virotech was going to the commercial trucking industry. Um, that has all since changed. Again, we work across the board, uh, multiple industries, multiple engines, and it opens up a lot of experience, um, things that have been solved in other industries that can be applied to motorsports and uh, some of these challenges that we're seeing today on the automotive side. And I touched on it a little bit earlier before, but two, Two industries in particular that we have a lot of experience on, experience in is marine performance and the defense industry. Now, when we think about low airflow, high performance applications, um, high temperature bays, it doesn't get much tougher than an inboard boat motor. Uh, now, Vibrotech TVD, we're an OE supplier to Volvo Penta. Uh, they're using a 6.2 liter GM based uh, V8. Uh, they needed, again, like Corvette Racing, they needed a durable solution. Um, they came to us because they were failing the rubber dampers. Um, they would run wide open throttle and burn them up in short time. So then they said, well, we got to back this with a warranty and we, we need a part that lasts. Um, so uh, we, uh, we uh, did all the analysis on it. Um, we understood what the, what the airflow was like coming into that, that engine bay, uh, temperatures they were seeing. And Aaron actually came up with a pretty cool solution here. Um, because they were running an accessory drive, um, we constructed the accessory pulley out of aluminum. And what that aluminum doubles as is a heat sink. Uh, as the viscous damper is doing work in generating heat, that aluminum pulley helps draw that heat out away from the damper, away from the damping medium, and dissipates it out into the engine bay. That, in turn, allows the viscous damper to hold up much longer. So after we came up with this solution, they uh, went back to Chesapeake Bay to their testing grounds, and they, they installed it. And they were doing durability testing, wide open throttle, up and down Chesapeake Bay all day long, 
they finally gave up on the testing because they couldn't wear it out. Anything you want to add to that, Aaron? <laughs> you know, if you've ever, you know, if you've ever been out boating, you know, especially with something with a little bit of power, you know, that there's really only two speeds, you know, idle and full throttle. And, you know, what one brings, you know, you're out full throttle everywhere and you got your grinning ear to ear. It's hard to imagine that getting boring, but uh, they got there. So what else do we see? Wide open, wide open throttle, uh, high performance low airflow. Um, this type of solution uh, crossed over into the fluid damper line with the LS3 L99 damper that we uh, made for the uh, Gen 5 Camaro SS. Those cars in road racing see a lot of track time, and uh, this this particular concept uh, has worked very well in road racing. It's also the same damper used on the uh, the LS based truck engines too, um, and so you know that gives us even better for like performance applications for like towing and pulling. Um, this provides a good solution for that as well. Uh, so that's a good crossover case study how our experience in marine is helping out motorsports. Another great one is the defense industry. Now, a peculiar thing about the defense industry, they look to motorsports, and motorsports looks to them. Um, and in the mid 2000s, the contract came down to replace the uh, everybody's favorite Humvee, uh, to replace that with a new joint light tactical vehicle. It would be the uh, um, the tactical vehicle for the future, used by the Army and the Marines. They needed something that was lighter, faster, more powerful. It could get in, get out, and not fail. Uh, those are pretty much the requirements. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be in on the ground level of that development with the engine supplier. Um, so at the ground level, we were doing uh, torsional vibration analysis, get damper design development, and then it all came together in the uh, the bid to, to help win this contract, and the damper had to go through NATO testing. Now, the NATO testing runs the 500-hour durability testing, running high RPM peak power, and then low RPM idle, no failures. It has to have no failures, 500 hours, full performance. And Aaron, if you want to shed some light on that, you were part of the, the project. I think you pretty much covered it on that. You know, it's basically it's just a cycle through process and you keep running different cycle conditions and you, know, you don't never know if this vehicle is going to be sit on base all day or if it's going to be run, you know, wide open, you know, out, out in action. So it's just a, a great way to validate the engine and and the parts and the components on the engine. So we were fortunate enough to uh, uh, to be a part of this project. The engine builder did win the contract. Uh, the uh, GLTV builder won the government contract as well too. So we are now an you know, official uh, subcontractor on the, on that. So uh, military diesel performance um, that carries over into diesel motorsports. Um, when you talking, you know, what we see today in the uh, the pro polling league and competitions like the Ultimate Callout Challenge, where they're pulling, you know. 3,000 horse and uh, upwards of 2,500 foot-pounds of torque um, to have a damper that's going to hold up under those conditions. Uh, a lot of that recent development on the food damper performance diesel side uh, came from military experience. So kind of wind this down a little bit, we're talking about all the crossover, how uh, experience outside the industry can be pulled in and to make a better damper both on the OE side and on the performance side. Um, talk, going to close things up, talk about a little bit about collaboration within the industry. And best case scenarios is when you have an experienced engine builder, such as the audience listening, when you're doing uh, race engines, do, maybe you're doing crate engines or production engines, or you're putting together a package. When the builder works with the manufacturers of the components, um, there's a lot of competitors and a lot of uh, choices and suppliers out there in the aftermarket. But when you start pulling together the crankshaft manufacturer with the damper manufacturer, with the rods and the pistons and everybody involved with the rotating assembly, when you bring them all together and design a total package and then test it and design for durability, great things happen. Um, so we're fortunate to be involved in a project uh, that we work together with uh, Wagler Competition Products. It was building a crate engine program for a 6.6 liter Duramax, um, swapping it out to internal balance. Uh, now, Cali's crankshaft makes a great internal balance uh, Duramax damper. So, Cali's was the crankshaft uh, supplier. 
Um, Wagler had us come in, Callie's had us come in, design a damper that's matched and optimized to this engine. Um, so Aaron got to work, uh, designed an internal balance Duramax engine. We went down to uh, Wagler's facility to do the dyno testing. Uh, and the chart to the right is the 10 order summation uh, summary. That's all the vibrations happening inside that engine summarized. Um, comparing their current damper to the fluid damper that was developed, both at part throttle and full throttle. And then also over there, we bring down our thermal imaging equipment because we want to check the thermal stability of the, of the damper, make sure it's going to hold up long term. Uh, it's not going to wear out prematurely. It's going to do exactly what we expect it to do. Um, so that was part of the testing and development as well. Um, Everyone in the process was so impressed how the whole total package came together. I, I guess to stress it was a collaborative effort. It was great teamwork, great synergy. Um, that uh, Jeremy Wagler himself quoted that uh, they proved to be the best. We'll be using fluid damper in all our in-house builds. That is a great example when collaboration comes together. Uh, so closing up on the notes, if uh, you're doing production engine work and you want to learn more about viscous dampers or about our design development process, I encourage you to to uh, check out the websites. Uh, there's a lot of resource material there to learn more about it. Uh, you can give us a call at 716-592-1000 or email us at support at fluiddamper.com. Um, I can facilitate you to the right contacts within the building, um, get conference calls here with Aaron to discuss individual products. Um, but beyond that, I'm gonna wind things down and say thank you for, for listening. Um, Aaron, you want anything to add? Just, uh, as Brian said, you know, I just want to thank you guys for taking the time to uh, listen. Hopefully, uh, you know, everyone was able to follow along as we come through there. I didn't put anybody to sleep. And uh, if you have any questions for us, uh, you know, feel free to ask them. Hey, we're going to turn it back over to Rob. Super. Thanks, guys. Excellent presentation. Um, it uh, lots of good information there, and we really appreciate uh, you taking the time out of your day to do that for us and educate us on on what you found. Um, on the tech line, I know we do get you know we we get pictures all the time where we're, we're taking crankshaft failure questions, you know, uh, asking about what could have caused crankshaft breakage and failure, and uh, it's it's this is good information that we can pass along. And um, you know, one question that's come in already, and it kind of goes in in line with what we see in the tech line is. You discussed about the wear signs of a stock elast elastomer damper, but what are some of the service or replacement signs for a viscous style damper? That's, a, that's an excellent question. And uh, we like to say in, in uh, most general automotive applications, uh, the viscous damper is not gonna wear out, it's gonna last the life of the engine. Now we know in extreme durability, high temperature cases that we wanna revisit that. Um, Aaron, you've worked with Volvo Penta on the marine side. They're writing OEM service manuals for these. What do what have you heard for recommendations? Well, because it's a sealed damper, it's very difficult to inspect the uh, the internal workings of the part without uh, you know hurting the part. Uh, some of our larger engine applications they actually have removable plugs, so you can actually pull a fluid sample and send that in for analysis. We can take a look at that. That's mostly on like large uh, you know gas pumping engines. But for small applications like fluid damper, uh, one of the biggest indicators of the damper is you want to make sure the damper is generating heat, like I talked about earlier, when it's converting the vibration over. So before, you know, if you have a, if you suspect that your damper might have some wear on it, what you want to do is either you know get like a temperature gun. A lot of times they have infrared ones, or even um, you can go on sites like McMaster Car and get a sticker that'll give you a permanent capture for the temperature. And maybe put put one of those stickers on the damper on the outer diameter, and put one on a bracket that's nearby it. And the damper should read hotter than that bracket, and that's how you know the damper is still um, working. Um, if that's you know if, if that's not the case, then there there could be something there. Um, and also you want to make sure that you don't have any dents in the damper. Uh, if if you dent the outer housing, the gap between the internal flywheel and um, the housing is quite small. So even a small dent could impact the performance of the part. And you also, uh, you know, on larger damper applications, um, you can actually take the damper and take a pair of micrometers and measure the overall thickness. 
and you want to get probably a good 10 places all the way around in the diameter and make sure that there's no variations. Uh, typically, I, I think like manufacturers like Volvo recommend no variation over you know, more than 20 thousandths of an inch if, or less. Um, and you want to make sure that's not just a paint variation on some of the bigger dampers. But uh, those are a few things to look for. And also, you want to make sure that if it's like for a press fit application, you want to make sure that the damper is uh, still has a good press fit. If you wear the press fit out, then you're going to have to either replace a hub or look at a different damper. Okay. All right. Um, another question's come in for you. Uh, this gentleman's asked, I had a lightweight crank pulley snap off during a car's launch at a high RPM. Could this have broke because of the intense engine harmonics breaking the pulley and not being able to absorb the vibration? So a lot of, so the, the vibration, a lightweight pulley is like, uh, I, I would say, it's a it's an it's an acceptable application for small or let, small horsepower applications. Um, if you think about like um, like a Honda D series engine, they, it's still an automotive engine, but they have a solid pulley uh, just because they have they don't have a lot of power, you know, to twist the crankshaft or you know produce enough vibration to get damage that. But once you start building that application up, you're going to build up um, you're going to build up your vibrations if you want to think of it like uh, ringing a bell if you you know lightly tap the bell it, it only rings a little bit but if you strike it really hard you're going to get a lot more ringing um, that's kind of what you see with your crankshaft when your engine fires so you may still have a similar vibrations but they're going to be amplified as you build it um, lightweight pulleys don't really provide much damping um, Similar to what I mentioned before with the bell, if you touch it with your hand even just a little bit, you you muffle some of that vibration, and that's kind of what the torsional damper does for your application. Where a lightweight pulley just lets it ring right out. Um, you know, some people kind of shy away from adding extra mass to the end of the crankshaft, but we've had you know numerous applications time and time again where you know we've gone to uh, the engine builder and put dampers on engines that are on dynos back to back. Um, and either we go, you know, you know, a larger damper, if it's properly, you know, properly sized to the engine, will make more power than something without a damper or an undersized damper, just because you're you're making the engine more efficient because you're not fighting the uh, RPM fluctuations with the crank twisting and rebounding. On uh, fluiddamper.com, there's a section called uh, engine vibration. And on that, it's a really interesting video. Uh, we took a five pound solid mass, um, think of it as a five pound solid pulley, uh, and compared it to a five pound viscous damper. And we put it on one of our test rigs, and it's a, it's a torsion bar test rig. So we load up the torsion bar, and then we let it go, and we can measure the rate of decay it takes and the time it takes for it to, to dampen. Uh, and there's quite a bit of difference in time for that. Uh, um, for the solid mass to, to slow down compared to the damper. And that's a really good visual representation of what's going on in the in the engine. You can see how effective a damper is for controlling a torsional twist. Right. So I, I guess the, the main thing is that uh, depending on the severity of what vibration you're running through it, you could potentially see a fairly quick failure if you don't have a properly uh, proper damper or you could, it could take a little bit more time. It depends on how much power you're running through the engine and how close you are to the limits of the strength of your, your crankshaft. Um, and you may not always crop up in a crankshaft failure either. Uh, I've got some experience with Mazda four cylinder engines and a lot of times with the B series engines, um, you know, the one three liter ones came with undamped crank pulleys, but like the 1.8 liters had rubber dampers and that's a very similar, you know, applications. Uh, and if you push enough power through one without a damped pulley, you can actually explode the oil pump gear, uh, and that'll then that'll kill your engine just because if the metal gets through into everything. Um, so you may see failures that really aren't crankshaft related, uh, but are still detrimental. Okay, all right. Uh, here's another good one. Um, after the engine is run for a period of time. Is touching the fluid damper and feeling warmth or heat a legitimate test? If it is cold, I was told it is not working properly. 
due to leakage or external damage, thus not functioning as it should be. Um, life cycle, uh, et cetera. Does that sound like uh, something legitimate? Yes, uh, like, like we mentioned before, uh, that, that could also be a symptom of an, a damper that's maybe not properly sized. If you look at our catalog, especially for our, like our big block Chevy dampers, um, we have a six and a quarter, a seven and a quarter, and an eight inch damper. And depending on um, uh, basically the stroke of the engine or um, you know, what power displacement, you know, what kind of cylinder pressures you're running, you may need a different size based on the others. Like let's say you're running an eight inch damper on something that would really be better suited for a six and a quarter. You may not be, the damper's not doing enough work to heat up all of that mass. So you could get away with a smaller damper. Um, but also if that mass isn't moving inside of there, you're not going to get um, heat generated either. So that is actually a legitimate test. Okay, all right. Um, one more question here for you. Uh, broken bolts due to vibration. I would assume you mean, uh, I, I guess he's talking about maybe within your, uh, within the webinar, but he's saying broken bolts due to vibration. I would assume you mean the main bolts. Uh, would they break mainly at the parting line between the main cap and the block? That, um, I mean, that, that can be due to that. That could also be due to, um, you know, you could be getting a bending mode in your crankshaft too if you're uh, running a lot of like an overhung load if you're running a really high belt load um, like like similar to uh, running too much tension on a blower belt um, you what you want to do is get a if you have a if you suspect that you're running um, you know a situation where your cranks moving around that much you if you can you may want to get an indicator on your crank and turn it over by hand to make sure that you're not running out but from too much external loading um, but also if, if you uh, run into that scenario, you know, you could also be in a situation where you may need a main bearing girdle or something to kind of connect your main bearings to your block. Um, but torsional vibration typically wouldn't necessarily cause that in and of itself. But if you have a compounding situation where you have torsional, axial, and possibly bending, that's where you'll see more of those. Um, because if it's pure torsion, then it just rotates on the mains. Okay. All right. So we got we got time for one more question. Um, I know there's other questions here, and what we'll do, everybody, is we'll pass those questions uh, over to Aaron and Brian. Uh, they'll answer them. Uh, we'll do that after the webinar. So expect to see your questions. You know, sometime in the next little bit, we'll get those all answered for you. Great presentation, guys. Excellent material. Uh, we we do appreciate it. Um, so one last question here for you. So this gentleman's asked. You know, where does the industry go from here? Uh, where else is the industry looking to balance engine harmonics with this technology? That's a that's an excellent question to to wrap up on. Um, you know, we we look at uh, what's trending, the requests that we got coming in, where performance is going. I think on the performance side, if we're going to get higher RPMs and we're going to really push that, like you know that they were doing in Formula One back in the mid 2000s, uh, we got to look at the valve train. Um, we got to settle down the, the camshafts, and um, we're already making camshaft dampers, both now in automotive hypercars and you know on the agricultural for noise and vibration and harshness. Um, you know, there's a lot of viability possibly in in looking at the valve train and applying viscous uh, viscous damper technology to the camshaft. Uh, what else you seeing there? Well, another big trend in in industry that I'm sure everyone's seeing, especially with new vehicle development, is hybridization. And that's not going away. I mean, you're going to see more and more applications that run some sort of hybrid electric drive system. And typically, you see much more of a problem in low load or off load conditions uh, where you would typically have the drive line be loaded, especially in an automatic application where you would see, you know, power slightly loading the drive line to keep things from running through backlash. Um, you know, in a hybrid drive situation, if you can apply a no load condition, you're going to save energy, so you're not going to have power depletion. But then you get systems that are free to vibrate, uh, you know, so they can roll through backlash, and that can actually be enough to cause a resonance in the passenger cabin. Uh, we see that quite a bit. Um, you know, we have quite a bit of experience for hybrid uh, mass transit buses and tour buses, 
uh, where you go through an application where, you know, they spend a lot of time off throttle, you know, coasting to a stop or maybe, you know, light acceleration. And you can see, you know, you can have audible resonances and we design dampers for that specific application. And then even like, you know, like WRC cars uh, where, you know, high performance rally applications that run into driveline resonances too. So, I mean, as you know, Brian touched on, as you push more and more RPM, you're going to see more in valve train dynamics that need to have need to have vibrations controlled, and then driveline systems. Yeah, ex excellent questions. And uh, as as Robin mentioned, uh, we'll be passing those on, and uh, we'll get those questions uh, answered as quickly as possible for you. No, much appreciated. And like I say, thank you again, guys. Great information. Um, uh, thank you for putting the uh, the effort in for all the slides. Great slides. So, uh, for those of you out there that still have questions, like I say, we'll get them over to Brian, over to Aaron, and we'll get you get you looked after there. So, for now, we're going to wind things up. I am going to bring Amanda back on. She's going to tell you a little bit more about how to wind things up and the survey and that kind of stuff. So, hey, Amanda. Hey, Rob. All right. Thanks again, everybody, for taking time out of your day and listening today. Um, you will get a follow-up email tomorrow that will contain a recording of today's webinar, and that is yours to use as you would like. You can pass it along to other people on staff, watch it at your convenience. Um, it's yours to do with as you wish. Also, when you leave today's webinar, there will be a survey that pops up. Please take a moment and fill that out. Let us know how we're doing, if there's anything else you'd like to see or any additional questions you may have, um, and we will be looking at that. And if there are any questions, we will pass those along as well. And then the last bit is you'll see our contact information is at the bottom. 815-526-7600 um, is the main line here at AERA, and that will get you in touch with any member of our staff. And then you'll also see my email and Rob's email listed below, along with Steve and Karen. So feel free to email any of us with anything you may need, and we are here to help. Thanks again, and we hope you all have a great day.